Right. Here's my handout, everyone. My name is Kit Chambers. Uh, my focus for this research was about um, focus on sprinting and track and field, and if uh, it's a learn or genetics that are allows elite sprinters to excel. Um, the reason why I chose elite sprinters, I chose this group of individuals because it allowed for me to have a lot more research and a lot more idea of um, where I wanted to go with this and it could get more background on the certain topics that I'm going to be focusing on. But uh, like I said, I'm working, looked into sprinting and track and field. Is it a learned technique or is it something genetics that allows for elite sprinters to excel? Uh, when I talk about elite uh, sprinters, I want to talk about sprinters that were involved in, they competed internationally or nationally for their country or nation. Um, so, for example, people like Usain Bolt, Sonia Richard Ross, uh, Justin Gatlin, anyone like that. Um, what I found out with a lot of the elite sprinters in today's day and age is they start at a very young age, um, usually 12, 15 years of age. Um, they'll start in middle school, some will start before that. They'll start about 10 with AAU, um, with uh, an athletic, and, uh, athletic admissions union. Um, and for the American athletes, they're able to join those teams, and that's where I think the ability to get the learn technique is incorporated, because you come across some of the best athletes in your area, you're able to compete against them and with them on teams. Um, so I think right here you're able to learn a lot at a young age that's going to show you that it could be a learn technique. Also, you get involved with some of the best coaches in your area and sometimes you'll even have coaches that are with the Junior Olympics for American athletes and sometimes the Olympic coaches will help out. Um, much like uh, American athletes, Jamaican athletes too have certain organizations like the AAU. They have the MVP League and that too starts for 12 to 15 years of age. For them, uh, I know Usain Bolt, he started at his school, it was strictly sprint, or it was a track and field school, as well as he got his education and everything like that. So um, he first started off in cricket actually, and they saw his speed while playing, I guess, the outfield. I don't really know cricket that well, but he was out there and a coach saw him and got him involved in track and field. So that's how he joined into the MVP league. And that right there is basically um, a league of some of the most elite sprinters that Jamaica has to offer. Um, and when it comes to training your athletes, uh, you can't just train all of them the same. You couldn't train me like you would train Kyle. I mean, clearly we're two completely different athletes. Um, you want to look at their body size. You can look into their blood lactate levels and areas like that. Um, this allows for the coach to know how far can he push his athletes before they're going to completely give out, they're going to cause cramps, anything like that. Um, strength training, this uh, it's not as important as it is in some sports, but it's still very important. Um, many coaches like to get their kids in the weight room two or three times a week, but it's not heavy lifting or anything like that. Mainly, uh, they're not there to build muscle, it's just there to keep the physique and get a different type of training. Um, for female athletes, um, you would work on their upper body. Um, their female athletes are, have a tendency to have a weaker upper body, so you get them in there uh, and work on that for them. The endurance training, that's also a very important key whenever it comes to training and track and field, obviously. And you need to adapt to your athletes individually. Like I said before, you're not going to train two athletes the same way. Uh, my endurance may be better than Jason, so I would probably be able to go a lot longer than he would, and so we wouldn't want to push him to someone that's at a higher level and cause him to fatigue or possibly become injured. So that doesn't help anyone at all. Um, these pictures right here, the top one, are just mainly some of the main areas you want to work on when it comes to um, your stretching or your type of motions that you're going to do to wake up the body, get them ready for practice, get ready for the training that day. Um, this one right here, uh, the first top pitcher is, uh, they're in the mood for the, the A skip. The A, B, and C skip are three main skips that you're gonna 
train your athletes or teach them at a very young age because this training through fast twitch muscle fiber gets that going, allows for them to have a quicker turn turnover rate. And with that turnover rate, you're able to have, pick up your feet, put them down, and move at a lot quicker speed. Also, when you're in the weight room, uh, you want to focus more on the lower body and get the quadriceps and everything um, more focused. And then down at the bottom is just some stretching. Um, I try to find better uh, pictures of more intense stretching, but this is probably going to be like your basic stretching just to start them out, probably at a younger age. Um, and then you'll, the older you get, the more intense the stretching will be. And since we're dressed professionally today, I wouldn't really be able to show you how to do any of the stretches, so I figured this would be a good little stepping spot so you could just have a general idea of what they do to teach their kids. And with the stretches, um, you want to be able to, like I said, elongate the fast twitch muscle fibers and get that going. And that right there, I think, would be something that could be taught for sprinters to be able to compete at an elite level or uh, maybe even uh, go from high school to D3 or somewhere like that to compete. Genetic advantages, um, something I thought was pretty awesome and I've never even heard of before, but in Jamaica they had this lower body symmetry test and it was a pretty interesting article I read and uh, they said that the straighter your knees and your ankles were the faster you would be. They didn't focus on the feet or anything like that, but I think they said they took up to 170 elite athletes in Jamaica, and through this they um, they tested their uh, the straightness of their knees to their ankles, and uh, they had I think it was around 70 women, and then 100 men, and then some of them were uh, discus throwers and shot putters. So you had your your heavier athletes too, but they said that even with them, the straighter it is, the faster they go. Um, the way they tested for this is they would just have them sit down, and they would take three tests, multiple tests, they would do the first one, and they would uh, just record the, I guess the circumference around their knees and their ankles, and then they'd go do another test standing to test the length and uh, I guess how straight their, that area was between those two. Um, that is a, uh, they've done that test twice in Jamaica now, and um, they started one in 1997, which was strictly called the, it was, well, I guess it was the lower body symmetry test, and this one they just took all that information, and with today's uh, science and everything, they were able to get more information from it, and uh, this is where I found out more about the ACTN3 and the R577X genotypes. And the ACTN3 is also called the Alpha Actin 3 genotype for anybody that might know more about that. Um, this is a test that they did along with the lower body symmetry test that uh, showed that this female sprinters benefit from this more than male sprinters. They Another test they did, I think they said it showed up in 18% of the Caucasian males that they had, and then it showed up in 37% of the African American males, and then females all together, 56% of the females tested positive for these two different genotypes. And again, this goes back to the fast twitch muscle fiber, and this will allow the athlete to have that, um, that ability to pick them up, or sorry, this is the coach, to pick them up and put them down. That's just one of my favorite sayings from track that I had. So um, testing for that gene, um, it's something that you can do. You could go ask a doctor or anyone, and they can test for those genes. Um, for the R577X gene, it's a, what they say is an NTDNA gene, which is something that is passed down from your mother's lineage. So you could go back and you could test that and see that if she passed it down to you, but it's not something that I could pass on to my kid. It's only something that comes from the maternal side. But the male or female child can get this, and it doesn't matter. Um, but it's not something they can check from the paternal side. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Um, and then again, like I said, it goes back to the recruitment process, and this gene helps with the fast twitch muscle fiber, and it allows for the uh, 
athlete to one, it helps from the Z line to enact the Z line a lot quicker than anyone that doesn't have this. Um, they did test this for, uh, I guess, just normal people. So if I would have tested and then would have tested against Usain Bolt, um, they're saying that since I didn't have the training or anything like that, that I didn't test positive for the AC, the Alpha Axon 3 genotype. So I guess that's something that you acquire through training and through years of experience in track and field because they said that in, I think, 23% of the people that were just normal athletes, they weren't experienced or elite or anything like that, um, that they, only 27 out of the, I forget the number, but 27 of them did test for it, but so a large majority of just occasional lifters or anything like that will not test for this. <clears throat> this right here, it's just a chart that I found showing um, different percentages of what athletes will have the different genes. Um, and right down here, it'll show you the power Olympians, the female powers, and then the endurance and sprinters down at the bottom. So I thought that was a pretty cool stat. Uh, it was interesting to see that the more power athletes that they have, so your Olympic lifters, stuff like that, um, they're gonna test higher for this because they're using the fast twitch muscle fiber a lot more for heavier lifts and a lot shorter time than say a sprinter who's gonna, they're not gonna, it's still gonna be in there, but it's not gonna react as fast as some of the power Olympics or the Olympians that power lift. And uh, this is just more about the mtDNA testing and uh, how it's broken down and how it can be passed down through your lineage and uh, how to go back and test through your parents or your mother, I guess. Um, so what I got from this is I do believe it can be a learned, you can teach someone to become an elite sprinter, but you need the genetic backing. You need to be able to have the genetic makeup and like I said, you needed the certain genotypes to be able to compete at a higher level. Um, I'd say if you're like earlier, if you're trying to go from high school to D3 or somewhere in there, you could probably make it without the genetic backing, but um, definitely genetic backing, I think, is what leads to a lot of success for today's uh, elite sprinters. Um, can you train athletes? I do think that is possible, but again, like I said, I think it goes back to you needing maybe not to set your goals as high. You maybe won't be in the Olympics, but unless you go, I guess, run for like a different country, that sprinting is not really their thing. And then is genetic backing important to elite athletes? I think it is very important. Um, something else that I do want to look into is to maybe try to get some of the, I guess, the genetic backing and lineage of some of the, today's athletes um, and see if like Sonia Richards-Ross or Usain Bolt or anyone like that to see if they've maybe done some of these tests to see um, if their parents passed down this genetic trait or if their parents were sprinters or uh, well-off athletes. <clears throat> so that's something that I think uh, you'd be able to lead more into the, uh, the research and the field of study in this. Um, so if anyone else has any thoughts or questions, I'm opening the floor to you. Genetic backing, you asked, you were talking about that's mtDNA? Is that what you were talking about? No, that's uh, actually just a test. It's a maternal trait DNA. So basically, you could go back and see if you, maybe some of your athleticism was given to you from your mother. So you could see, you could get tested, and so could she to see if maybe some of the genes that she had are the reason why you excel at football or something like that. So. spoke uh, briefly on the weight training. Did you run across any specific movements that aided in speed? Um, movements that they showed were probably, uh, in my experience, would probably be some leg press, light leg press, anything like that, just to get the quadriceps or anything like that. But um, that's 
not really an area that I look too heavily into. I probably should have done more of that, but uh, so mainly I just, I'm sure there is. Oh, upper body, I did find one about that. Lightweight, resistance bands. Um, get your upper body going, work on that fast movement. That's gonna allow for the faster your arms go, faster your legs are gonna go. It's just gonna follow you in a process like that. So probably do some upper body resistance training, stuff like that. You mentioned something you kind of lost me about their legs being straight. Uh, the lower body so symmetry well, test. Yes. So if you just look at someone, are, were you saying that you're able to tell if they? No, uh, they actually, like I said, they do an actual test there, and they would have the athletes. They would have them cycle through basically, and they'd have different <laughs> testers. They would. Um, I mean, I couldn't look at you and say, man, you're going to be a fast athlete just by looking at your legs. It's something that you probably have to have more of the backing into and have the, I guess, the skill set and knowledge of what you're testing for and everything. But the stuff that I found was they would, uh, like I said, test the circumference of their knees, their ankles, and then from there they would test, uh, I guess, the straightness in between that, that area right there. Okay. And so through that, um, that's kind of where they would put you into different groups, I guess. And they didn't really do anything that was based off like weight or height or anything. They specifically put you in groups based upon um, how straight your legs were, so. Uh, so based on that, you're saying the basic assumption would be someone who has straight legs faster than someone who's bow-legged? Yes, that okay. is what I got away from that, or that's what I took away from that. Um, that's something else, I mean, It'd be awesome to do a test like that and find someone that is bow-legged or anything like that and find more information on how exactly they test and then test someone else that has um, symmetrical <coughs> knees through the ankle and be able to give you a better idea right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.